Then, so, um, you know, I just also want to say a word about what's going on in St. Louis. Uh, the, the big issue that they're considering is whether or not to uh, ordain gay pastors and whether or not to perform uh, ceremonies for gay couples in our churches. And uh, there's, there are three options that are being considered. Um, one of them is basically to leave things as it is right now. One of them is to, uh, two of them could possibly involve uh, even uh, splitting our denomination. And so it is sort of a perilous time that our denomination is, is in. Um, I'm hoping that our denomination will be able to stay together. Uh, we just don't know because many denominations have split over this issue. So that's what we're asking you to, to keep in prayer uh, over the next few days, uh, hopefully for the, for the unity of our uh, denomination, that whatever way is chosen, that people will be able to be reconciled uh, with each other and follow the example of uh, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, who said, if your heart is as my heart is, give me your hand. Uh, he practiced unity, and I hope that we'll be able to to uh, maintain that as a denomination. So my sermon today is a number, uh, another in a series that I've been giving on building a excellent relationship with God, which I'm calling Constructing Your Spiritual Palace. Today I'm talking about uh, five of the six elements that are the concrete and the foundation of our spiritual palace. And regular concrete is made up of six different elements, calcium, silicon, aluminum, iron, water, and sand or gravel. And our spiritual cement is also made up of six elements as well. Uh, last week I spoke about one of those elements, and that is the self-awareness that comes to us from doing an examination of our conscience, a moral inventory uh, in which we get to really see what there may be inside us that is preventing us from closeness to God or what we're not doing that may be preventing us from closeness to God. Uh, before I get too far into the substance of what I'm talking about today, I want to start with a funny story that's kind of related to that. A young construction worker was bragging to the other guys at the construction site about how strong he is. And he was particularly getting after a couple of the older guys and making fun of them and saying, you know, I'm so much stronger than you are and so on and so on. So one of the older guys said, well, why don't you put your money where your mouth is? He said, I'll bet you $20 I can wheel something across the site in this wheelbarrow that you won't be able to wheel back. The guy says, you're on. The old guy picks up the wheelbarrow and says, okay, get in. <laughs> Thank you. Let's join together for a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, I thank you for the privilege and the responsibility of sharing your word with your congregation this morning. I pray, Lord, that all that I say and all that we hear would be acceptable in your sight, for you are our creator, our redeemer and our sustainer. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So for those of you who may have missed the sermon last week, I was talking about how to prepare the soil in our heart for the foundation. And that preparation is that, that uh, fearless moral inventory that I was talking about. And I mentioned that uh, both in connection to the sermon series, but also because Lent is coming up, and I'm inviting you to think about what you might give up for God or what you might take on for God during the time of Lent. But that, uh, that moral inventory that we take, uh, that time of reflection to see what is in our, our conscience, is also an essential part of the elements that go into making this spiritual foundation for us to build a spiritual palace on. Um, when we do a moral inventory, when we examine our conscience and really take an honest look at what's inside us, the result should be an increase in our humility because the result should be that we recognize the areas where we fall short compared to where God would like us to be. Now, humility is so important. Humility is foundational. Without humility, we block out God's ability to work inside us 
with the power of the Holy Spirit. Humility is an essential element. If we don't have it, uh, we don't have the, the elements that we need. It's like if, you don't, if you're missing calcium from the concrete, it won't be much in the way of concrete. If we don't have humility, our spiritual foundation is not going to work. Now, our denomination, about nine years ago, started a program to help our churches across the country to be stronger. And it was based on a book by one of the Methodist bishops. And in the book, he was promoting the idea that we as a church, all of our churches, should practice what he called radical hospitality. And I always thought that was kind of a funny term. Uh, but radical hospitality really boiled down to we should be extra welcoming to people. We should go out of our way to be welcoming. I'm teaching a Bible study right now, a uh, disciple Bible study, and every week there's a section in there that says radical disciple. And it's really not that radical. It just says that we should take our discipleship seriously and really take it to heart. But Jesus practiced truly radical humility. His humility was so far over the top, so far in excess of what we would consider to be maybe a normal, that is just amazing. And when we think about it as something that we should imitate, it seems about as difficult to achieve as climbing a mountain. Um, Jesus' humility was amazing. I'll give you a couple of examples. These are in your scripture quotes and notes sheets, by the way. A, uh, a teacher of the, of the religious laws came up to him and said, Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied with amazing humility. He said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God the Father. And so Jesus is putting himself in second place to God, acknowledging uh, his relationship to God. Now, Jesus taught his disciples repeatedly and gave examples in his life uh, that we should be humble. We should be humble before God. We should not judge others. Uh, we should not look down on others because of their sins, recognizing that we also are sinners. And he taught them this. He said, those of you, and this is a, a little bit different than the translation that's in your scripture notes and quotes sheet, but it's the same, uh, same story. Those of you who want to be great must be servants, and whoever wants to be the greatest among you must be a servant of all. For even the Son of Man, talking about himself, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a sacrifice or a ransom for many. Now, when we think about the spiritual power that Jesus had at his command to be able to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to walk on the water, to feed 5,000 people with a few loaves of bread, and yet he said he was the servant of all people. And he demonstrated this radical humility in washing the disciples' feet at the Last Supper. Now, the part that really blows my mind is not just that he would wash their feet, but that knowing that Judas was about to leave and go betray him, that the result of that betrayal was going to be his arrest, that he was going to be subjected to this horrible whipping with the Roman whip with the lead tips on the end of it, and that he was going to be put to death in the most horrible way imaginable, a crucifixion, knowing that Judas is about to leave and, and turn him in for that, he washes Judas' feet. Now that's not just an act of forgiveness, but it's an act of humility because what he's being humble for, he's being humble before God and saying, God, whatever you have in store for me, whatever path you have laid out for me, I'm willing to walk. And that is the most amazing level of humility. Now, he sets an example for us. If we want to have an excellent relationship with God, if we want to have some kind of relationship that is similar to what Jesus had, we also have to be extremely humble. 
We have to recognize our place before God. One of my favorite theologians is uh, Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton was a, a Catholic priest, brilliant theologian, and he wrote this, Pride makes us artificial, and humility makes us real. I like that definition because what humility really is, is facing the truth, facing the reality of where we are. And the truth for us is that we do need God. Um, we recognize that God is not just our creator, but really is our redeemer through Jesus Christ. We need a redeemer. We need the love of God. And we need the sustaining power of God that comes to us through the Holy Spirit. Humility is just about acknowledging that need that we have. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a great thing. Now, the other, or three of the other ingredients that go into our spiritual concrete, they go together. And that is desire to know God, desire to uh, uh, serve uh, God or please God, and the love that we have for God. So the desire to know God, to please God, and to love God. And th those things go together because each one, when we strengthen one, strengthens the other. Uh, Brother Lawrence, who was a 17th century Catholic monk, was uh, widely known as, one, as a saintly man, a man who was very close to God. He never wrote a book himself, but he was so impressive that uh, a member of his community followed him around for a couple of months, just picking his brain, recording what he had to say, and writing down his philosophies and his words in a book called The Practice of the Presence of God. And he quoted Brother Lawrence saying this, Let us occupy ourselves entirely in knowing God. The more we know God, the more we will desire to know him. As love increases with knowledge, the more we know God, the more we will truly love God. And so those things go together. The more we know God, the more we love God. The more we love God, the more we desire to be pleasing to God. The more we desire to be pleasing God, the more we know God, the more we're going to love God. And so they just, together, each one reinforces the other. And the common factor here is it's all about growth. That uh, over the course of our relationship with God in time, we're growing in our love of God, in our knowledge of God, in our desire to be pleasing to God. And those things continue to build throughout our lifetime. And they are essential parts uh, for the spiritual mix of the concrete. Now I said that we are like uh, like the sand or the, the final element of this mix. And I thought it was interesting. I didn't think, I didn't realize this till after I, I wrote that. You know, um, Adam, the book of Genesis says, Adam was created from the soil of the earth. And in Hebrew, uh, Adam's name is Adam, but the soil of the earth, the word is Adama. So Adam is made of Adama. Uh, Adam is, for the Hebrew speakers, it's understood, he's the earth man. He's made from earth. And of course, uh, the word humble means low down to the earth. And we are that, we are the element uh, in the mix. We are the sand. Now love is the activating force that brings it all together. If I take a bag of ready mixed concrete and I put it into a wheelbarrow, it stays in that powdered form until water is added. And as soon as water is added, it activates a chemical reaction that transforms those things and it creates a mineral, a hardened mineral, which is concrete. And love is like that in us. It takes that mixture of ourselves, of our desire to know God, our desire to please God, our humility, our self-awareness, it takes all those elements and love activates them and makes us a child of God. It makes us like that concrete stronger than we would be without it. 
And so uh, the love of God is the active force that really is what makes us children of God. And we are responsible to do the work. Uh, our part is to do that work, to be the foundation. We're the ones who are called to examine our conscience, to practice humility. We're the ones who have to open our hearts to, to God so they can be filled with love. And God's part is to provide the love. We love God because God first loved us. When we want to grow in our knowledge of God, when we want to grow in our love of God, um, we just need to respond to the love of God. As we see God working in the people around us, in the things around us, uh, it increases the love that we have for God. Of course, we can grow to know God better and love God more by coming to church, by reading the Bible, by our prayers. But in our daily life, just by looking at the people and the things around us and seeing God's love in action, um, our love is increased. And that foundation that we have becomes stronger. Now in Proverbs 10, we read this. When the storms of life come, the wicked are whirled away, but the godly have a lasting foundation. And you remember a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that Jesus said, those who listen to him, who obey his commands, are like those who build their house on a solid rock. And when the storms come, that house will stand. The scriptures also tell us that if we believe, we believe because God has called us, but God has reached into us with the Holy Spirit. So every one of us here who is a believer is a believer because God has chosen us and God has touched us with his Holy Spirit. And so thanks be to God that God has called us, chosen us, and that we have responded to that call with faith. And therefore, each one of us is already in the process of building up that foundation that doesn't just stand up to the storms of life, but that also allows us to build that beautiful spiritual palace relationship with God. Amen? So we are blessed that God has called us, that God loves us, and that God is working within us through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the blessing that God has given to us. Let's join together for a word of prayer. Lord, we give thanks and praise that your creative power extends throughout the universe. And in the midst of all of this creation, you have placed us. You've nurtured us, enabled us to be your children. And you have called us to respond to your love with our love for you. We ask, Lord, that you'd give us eyes to see you and the people and things around us that our knowledge of you might increase. We pray that you would guide us as we seek to continually grow in our knowledge of you and our love for you and in our desire to serve you and make a difference for you. And all this we pray and thank you for in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Lord. Amen.